that triangle and the friendships and the dynamics. And Michael and Ben and Ryder, can you guys kind of touch on what it was like early on for you? Was there always that chemistry between you as the actors and your characters? Did it take a little while to kind of find that rapport that the fans grew to love so much? Um, you know, actually, the pilot, the original draft of the pilot, I had like two lines. And um, I think the original concept was that there was always going to be two best friends, two guy best friends for Corey. So we kept trying that for about, you know, three or four episodes. If you go back, there's always like another kid that's sitting with us. And then the next week, there's another kid sitting with us. And this is totally insider and awful, but we used to have a chair that we called the death chair <laughs> in the cafeteria because whoever sat in it wouldn't be back the next week. And part of the thing that Mike was talking about in that, um, the uh, Corey's Alternative Friends episode, which is the episode that introduced Topanga, the, um, that, that was the week that they decided to give my character more of a character too, and we all felt it, and we all just felt it click. Um, that also explains why my character has a sister named Stacy that was never referenced again. <laughs> because all of those scenes were written for another best friend that we couldn't find. So they decided to just give me all of that, that person's lines, and um, I don't know, we all just felt it, you know? Um, that, that, that scene where um, uh, Danielle pushes Ben up against the locker, and the scene where they're playing uh, basketball with socks. I mean, it was it was incredible. Like, I just remember feeling that. I mean, even at the age of 13 on the set, we were like, oh, oh, this is a real TV show. This is what it's all about. And um, yeah, the rest is history. So no, it, it actually took a little while, I think. And it, it came, I mean, I think, you know, the best TV shows are always a combination of a good concept and then really strong writing. And then it comes down to whether the cast can get along and whether they can fit into each other's, you know, comedy. And we did, and it was kind of ridiculous. Like, to this day, I think Ben and I, you know, if we were given a scene, it would be like, you know, we just know each other's acting brains so well, and it's just so much fun. And kind of the same thing with um, Danielle coming to the cast and the Corey Topanka dynamic. Is it always the plan once she was part of the show to have that young love story carry through the entire series and sort of be, the, you know, one of the two kind of back backbones of the show? Yeah, it was. There was never any question that there would be a love story in the show. But we thought that the, the, the most interesting thing to do would be to start out understanding the boy. The pilot was about his confusion. The reason uh, Ryder's character, Sean, by the way, uh, Ryder's not bad inside of stuff. Ryder was the first actor to show up in casting. Um, we, we uh, um, um, there were, I don't know, 30, 40 guys on that day and there were hundreds scheduled. And so the casting director uh, brought Ryder in, and I shook Ryder's hand, and he had done the Miserable. It wasn't, he was very young, so it wasn't a giant resume, but a very impressive one. <laughs> and Ryder auditioned, and I turned to the casting director and said, okay, that's fine. And she said, what do you mean? I have 40 people out here, and we've got hundreds. I said, no, that's fine, that's my guy. <laughs> and she said, well, Shall I have everybody else go home? <laughs> and I said, no, have everybody else sit in that chair writer's talking. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, when when we we solidified um, the, the Corey's confusion in the pilot as to what life was, and then the fact that he had a best friend, the next natural step was to bring him to Panga. And it all clicked from there. And Ben, we saw Corey's sort of awkward years and Navigating a romance as a I'm young boy. I'm still having those awkward <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I ever grew out of that awkward phase. Yeah, how much of that kind of translated to the screen? Because you guys were, you know, the age that you were playing and young. Yeah. Love. Is that weird? Was that weird um, to have your whole life uh, on camera <laughs> from the time you're 13 years old? No, it's not weird at all. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess it was weird, but it was also just kind of the world I knew, and that's just the way I grew up. And. Um, you know, it was a really fun, exciting experience, and I don't know, I think that uh, the writers and everyone did a really nice job of uh, not only, not avoiding it, but almost embracing kind of the awkward years of, you know, any teen. And I, again, I think that's what a lot of people um, can almost identify with, you know, when they watch the show. It's like, oh, I went through that too, I went through that too, as opposed to characters that they couldn't really, you know, relate to. So, it was nice, I guess. <laughs> uh, Betsy. Yeah. You and, I mean, being a parent on the show nowadays, there really aren't 
parents like you were on the show. Did you know back then you were kind of part of a dying breed of responsible <laughs> parents on the show? We miss people like you on series today. I thought it was so great. <laughs> I thought it was a really good mom. Actually, Hell, you were the best great. mom. They're not around anymore on TV, really. really? Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at the time either. But I was a real mom in life. I mean, I, I was a mom in real life. And um, so I think that what we did, what Rusty and I did was what we would do with our own kids. And we treated each other with a great deal of respect. So um, it worked. Yeah. I think it worked. And you guys tackled so many really serious issues on the show. Was that always really important to kind of ingrain in the series? Well, they sometimes wrote two two part episodes for me because I was good at crying or something. I don't know. <laughs> Topanga ran away, that was with Olivia Hussey, that was a great one. Um, yeah, there were some important things because that's what happens in life, you know, when you're growing up and marriages and all sorts of things. I think Michael really covered everything, I think, for seven years. I mean, that's a lot of years to cover all those issues because each age required a new element. Yeah, know? I think that one of the, the things that worked real well was that Benson and Rusty were really, really well respected as parents on the show. And the show that, that Bats is talking about, um, which is, we sort of fashioned uh, Corey and Topanga's running and Juliet, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to actually get Juliet to be the conflict? Um, because Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, of course, starred Olivia Hussey. And so Olivia Hussey played Topanga's aunt. And what we thought was, if Betsy comes against this relationship. You know, if she was if, if she was not liked as the mother, if she was uh, someone that wasn't as well respected and did such a great job, then it would have been tough to write that. But to have Betsy come against the relationship and to have Ben make this iconic monologue at his mother in defense of his love for Topanga and go against Betsy, that worked because you had somebody who was very respected as an authority figure, and you had someone who was trying to find his way, and the fact that he would defend Topanga to that authority figure worked so well for the audience. And I, I, came, I didn't cave in, I, I saw the light. That's what worked. You know, that was neat. Yeah. Sometimes parents can be wrong. <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe. Matthew and Minglin and Trini, you guys came in much later in the game, but for the audience at least, it, it seemed really seamless, all of your transitions onto the show. I know you had kind of a funny story when we talked yesterday, but I mean, behind the scenes, was it as seamless? Was it easy kind of finding that chemistry with the cast back then? Well, um, from speaking for myself, uh, uh, the first week I was there, um, you know, in August to come, uh, taping, you have a, a table read, and then you rehearse, and then you have a thing called a, a run-through for the network, for the writers, and everybody that's involved and see how the progress is going. And, uh, and then after that run through, uh, you have notes, where you know you get notes and stuff on what we did. And I think out of the, I don't know, uh, 100 notes were given, I got about 89 of them. <laughs> um, and uh, it, was, it was, I was, I felt, you know, like I was doing a really bad job, and, uh, and these guys all kind of rallied around me and, uh, and, and really just helped me elevate my game. And, uh, and Simulating into the cast, and it was just, it was just amazing how quickly it kind of happened. It happened literally, I think that third or fourth day, it just started, started to happen. So, for me, yeah, it's funny. I didn't audition for Boy Meets World. I auditioned for Zoe Duck and Jack and Jane. So that's where I, I met Mike. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I came in, it's funny because for my audition, Mike gave me so many notes, and I was like, Oh my God, he hates me. But then at the end, he's like, Okay, I love you. <laughs> but um, I didn't get the part for Zoe, obviously. <laughs> but Michael was so sweet. He, and he added, said, we're going to add you to Boy Meets World. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to be on Boy Meets World. That was like the best day of my life. <laughs> so, um, but then when I came into the cast, I was really nervous because they were all an established cast. And, and everybody was like a family and everything. But they completely welcomed me with open arms. Because I was the, the last of these members to come in. So um, I really feel special. It was really like a family. <laughs> Zoe, Duncan, Jack, and Jane ran for about seven seconds. <laughs> Trina? Well, you know, 
my experience is really funny in auditioning because I auditioned five times before they finally said yes, and I would come into this, you know, producer's read, and it'd be me and five other girls. Okay, come back tomorrow. There's me and five other girls, new girls. And I just, I couldn't believe it when they actually cast me. I felt so blessed and I was so grateful. And I really enjoyed, I never felt, you know, you know, on the outside, you know, I felt more like, you know, this is an established family and it was my job to ingratiate myself in, into their world, you know, boy meets world. And I, and I did the best I could, could. And I really liked the fact that there was, um, particularly in my storyline, there was always this, you know, colorless love between me and Sean. And I just thought it was so needed and important at the time. And um, I think it really did wonders for me as a person. And the feedback I get from audiences is just incredible. And, you know, and I, I hope it promotes more of that in the world, you know. If that's it, that's really amazing. Now, Lily, you were on early in the series, and you just stole every scene you were in. The fans loved your little one-liners. Um, what was it like being the youngest of such a young cast and sort of coming in, saying the line, and leaving the scene? <laughs> um, it was an amazing experience. It really was. The cast, I mean, it was so much fun being on set with you guys. It was just a really joyous um, group, of, <clears throat> group of people, and it was such an honor to to play with you guys, and um, I learned so much from being around you as an actor and looking up to you guys and really learning from your your styles and your, your comedic deliveries. It was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. You were four. Yes, I was four. <laughs> writer yesterday, there, that was hardcore emotion from you in that final scene. Was that real? I mean, that's such a huge part of your guys' life, and saying goodbye to Mr. Feeney, that was I don't tough. think you guys could hear us laughing <laughs> in the back when that was happening, because we, we snuck in to watch just the last moments there, and Michael is over my shoulder going, be a professional, don't grab your nose. So like, sure enough, on camera, I grabbed my nose, because I was like snotting all over the place. We only, did that, we only did that last scene in one take, because we were all too just wrecked. It was our last last scene, last in front of an audience. It was like, you know, seven years. It was kind of like high school and college all rolled into one and saying goodbye to each other. And you know, we had no idea what, what was, we were exactly in the position that our characters were in. I mean, to the extent that I was going to New York, like in my personal life, I was moving to New York to go to college. So it was like, I mean, it was so close to home that yeah, there's like no filter between Sean and Ryder at that point. It's just the same person freaking out. I even, I even kept a little jacket and took it with me to New York. So. And then it got stolen out of my car in Brooklyn. So I know, I'm so pissed. Like, because you know, I had to, I had to give Disney a fake other leather jacket because they want to keep all that stuff. So sorry, Disney. I wow. Is all coming out of the car. Some hipster in Brooklyn stole. Anything else you want to admit, Ryder? <laughs> Any other stolen property you want to talk about? Ryder, you owe me seven hundred and forty-seven dollars. You know, I was that best scene for me. Yeah. Was about Danielle's tattoo. Oh. We, we were only going to do it one time. We, the writers and I, we stand off at a pool, what's called a quad split, which means we have four monitors, which are the four cameras. And I'm watching the scene. And I turned to one of the other writers, it was Barry Zabjic, who's on Sullivan or something, and um, he says, what's on her neck? <laughs> and I, I mean, there's tears coming out of my eyes because I'm watching each one of, ostensibly my children, go through this emotion. I'm going, we are actually only going to do this as an in one scene. Fantastic. And Barry goes, I said, what's on her neck? <laughs> and I go, uh, Chinese letters. <laughs> he goes, did you ever know they were there before? I said, hair has never given her pigtails before. And Barry said, why would they do that on a final scene of a seven year <laughs> And I said, I don't know, but I can't fire them now. <laughs> Wait, um, did you guys watch that last scene? Because um, I was just gonna pick up what Ryder was saying. Is that when we were 
when we were watching that scene, it really was like almost saying goodbye to our childhood. So when we were watching that episode, it's just it, every time I, I, it's hard for me to even watch that scene because it's really like that was kind of the end of the end of our childhood. So it wasn't just the end of our show, but just for us personally, just it really meant a lot. And also, I was going through my closet the other day, and I found these really nice black leather shoes. And I looked on the bottom, and it said Corey. <laughs> Thirteen years later, I still have that those shoes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll pay you back. Uh, Michael, I feel like I would be doing a disservice to fans if we didn't talk about Mr. Feeney and the relationship between the core cast and him. In the final scene, it kind of sums it all up. It just, I don't know if when we all saw the pilot or early on in the series, we thought that would become such an integral part to the show, but did you always know that he was going to be this father, grandfather kind of figure to the kids? And why make that sort of the centerpiece of the finale? That was intended. That was how the show was actually sold. Um, it's, it's, it's a funny story. It's not a long one. Uh, I had just finished Dinosaurs, and, and uh, I was walking to my office at Disney, and there was a fellow who stopped me and said, come into my office. And he showed me a bunch of charts and graphs. And it was Procter & Gamble, how much money goes directly out of kids' pockets, how much money goes indirectly, which means allowance. Um, and they, they make their father and mother buy these. And, and the fellow said, what's your next show? And I said, I just finished this show. I, I mean, I'll go and I'll think about it. He said, you do a show for this demographic. You're writing well for this demographic. And what he made me think of was that all of the shows that had been done were shows that family ties, um, uh, uh, growing pains. Y you take the oldest uh, brother or sister, you focus on them, you do the first date story. And I said, what if we took a middle child? What if the first date story was actually a betrayal because the brothers lived in the same room. So instead of going to the baseball game together, he took his first date, and the pilot was about the reaction of the younger brother to that. That was coming out of this man's office, and then I, I walked down to the president of Disney Television, and I said, I have something. And Boy Meets World was born right there. What's the conflict? Because we got the core relationships. Well, what if there's an implacable wall? What if there is a figure who is absolutely unable to be moved? Who would it be? In a child's world, if it's a workplace comedy, the workplace is school, the boss is the teacher. And what if the teacher lived next door? <laughs> and we had our show, because to give the authority figure proximity was everything. And the scenes at that little white fence with Bill and Ben were to me absolutely, Bill came to me one day and, and this was about three episodes in and he was getting tired already because the kids were kids. <laughs> and, and Bill is an actor of a long re resume and, and Kids did not respect that. <laughs> and the kids thought he was from England, which we, which we used to talk about on the show. I don't know if it was Ben or, or Ryder. Well, you're British. You wouldn't understand this show. <laughs> I'm not British. And, and that went on all the time. And, and, and Bill, Bill used to come to me and he would say, Michael, how long am I going to stand by this picket fence? <laughs> and I said, why do you have to go back to England? <laughs> and so that was when I joined the kids army, and Bill was happy to be all, all of our implacable Um, Do you guys, I mean, just kind of going down the table or whatever order, do you have sort of a favorite moment for your character over all the seasons, or a moment on the show, anything? Whoever can jump in. I liked when I said, I'm the screamer up in here. <laughs> you know, that was my favorite moment, you know, aside from many, many others. Actually, I got one more. I had, there was a scene where uh, we, there was a, it was a cheerleading episode, and I wasn't feeling so great that day, and Ryder whispers in my ear to say the line differently, real crazy, and stop kissing, right, before the take. 
And I did it, and it made everybody laugh. And I was like, what am I excited for? This is so silly. I'm on TV, you know. So I always remember that because Ryder always was such a such a champion for me, you know. <laughs> that uh, scream episode that uh, we called the scream episode. It's like the Halloween. Do you guys remember this one? It's that was by far the most fun we've ever had. Like probably in our lives. It was so. We, it was a disaster for Michael and everybody. You know that actually had to get through that night. But for us, we were laughing so hard because it was the, one of the first episodes where we really went surreal. You know, a Boy Meets World like by fourth or fifth season, we just started getting more and more meta and like referencing the fact that like, you know, we replaced Lily with a different actress. It was like, what? And like, we were making all these weird jokes and um, you know, so that episode really took it to the extreme. I mean, I watch it now and I still don't know what's going on. It's like, um, but yeah, so it was in reference to all these horror films, but that was one of the best. We laughed so hard and couldn't get through a single take. One of the best nights. I concur, it was awesome. <laughs> I have one. Um, I can't remember if it was a dream or what, but you were in jail, and I was Natasha. <laughs> Natasha Bowling. So I came in. I came in. You were in jail. It was oh, a dream. On the show. On the show. <laughs> no, Ryder was in jail. Okay, I'm sorry. Then. You, Go on. Corey, you were in jail, and I think it was a bad dream or something. But I was dressed up in the fifties clothes, and I go in and I go. Do you have the papers? <laughs> because I was Natasha. <laughs> Lily, do you have one together? Oh, yeah. My favorite was the war episode, and also the one after we all got to work together. And um, it was kind of fun playing with Ryder and Ben. <laughs> ben had the best line of the whole. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we're going up. You've never been to the beach with Ryder before. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it as well as I can. <laughs> I was actually impressed that we got a bear. That was real honey in that episode. <laughs> yes, you guys had to get cleaned up in the car. Yeah, there was a bear. There was a, there was a prank episode. There was a bear, and before the bear showed up on set, which was. You know, there and they had like you know a chain around its neck and they handed out flyers saying okay nobody have food anywhere near the bear and don't move fast well in the scene we're covered in honey and we run away from the bear i was terrified um i just uh my best memories i guess are um i loved all the tea parties <laughs> That was lots of fun and, uh, and dressing Phil Daniels up in all the jewelry in the hat. <laughs> that was that was a great moment for me. And just every day on set was so much fun, and backstage everybody was just such a laugh, and it was it was a really great part. Now, before I open it up to fan questions, a girl meets world kind of question that I think all of you can kind of chime in on. Just why is now the right time for a show so similar to Boy Meets World to? come back onto television and why do you think the fan reaction has just been so immense? It's a different world than, than this cast met. And I think that... Um, you were, you were going to say something? No, please. No, please, go ahead. No, please. <laughs> Let's not fight in front of them, just go. <laughs> okay. Alright, tell me if you like this answer. Go. <laughs> it's a different world than you met. <laughs> and and again, I've watched television and I love television and I was a child of television and, and we do what we love and we've been very lucky. And I don't see anything on television r right now that is speaking to the audience that I have always spoken to and that I care very much about. The reason to do Girl Meets World now is because I think that television and this world, if we can do it and honor this show and make it unique because it's a different world, that's the reason to do it. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, Ben, I'm just gonna keep you from talking to <laughs> Okay. I had a favorite moment. Oh, yeah. yeah, of the whole series. <laughs> and it's, oh. it's, and it's, and it's. <laughs> I think this microphone isn't as good. I'm funnier in this microphone. <laughs> 
Camera one. Camera two. Okay, go on. Ready. Go. And, and my favorite moment had nothing to do with Ben. <laughs> it was, it had to do with my son, Daniel. Um, do you remember in, in the finale, I think, I, I'm sure that it was part of the finale, the, the explanation of what Boy Meets World meant when the, the Joshua Matthews character who was played by my son Daniel. Um, Daniel was also the little boy. All my kids got to be in the show. And, and, and um, Daniel was also the little boy with the shirt that came up to here in the hallway when he said, I see dead people. <laughs> and, and the writing staff said, you can't use Daniel again. And I said, all right, then I won't. I, I said, let's cast the role, we'll, we'll, we'll cast an actor. And we cast this actor who all he was supposed to do was stand next to Ben, be his new baby brother, and listen to him. This actor, Ben said, well, and the actor started tearing across the set, tearing across the set, hitting everybody. <laughs> Wouldn't stop, started screaming, ow, wow. And, and, and one of the writers said, get Daniel. I called my wife, Patty, and I said, where are you? And she said, I'm at Gelson's, which was a grocery store in, in our town. And I said, are you with Danny? Yes. And, and bring him with what he's wearing. It doesn't matter what he's wearing. He needs to be on the set now. <laughs> and so Daniel shows up. And all I said to Daniel was, listen to Ben, watch him, don't say anything. And Ben said, Joshua, and Daniel goes, yeah. <laughs> and, and Ben is talking, and Danny goes, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. And, and Ben says, would you like to go over to the panga? Danny goes, to the panga. <laughs> it was one take, he was unbelievable, and on the back of his neck, he didn't have any tattoos. <laughs>
amazing to work for somebody like that because you know that his goal every single time is to deliver a product to the audience that's the best it can be. And uh, I mean, it's really fun. He's uh, he's just he's amazing. Reuniting with Ben has been even better than I could have possibly imagined it was going to be, and I had already pretty much expected that it was going to be awesome. But um, after being apart for so many years and not working together, I think we were both a little nervous that maybe being Corey and Topanga wouldn't come back as naturally to us as you would think it would. Uh, but it totally did. The minute we walked into rehearsals, Ben was Corey and I was Topanga, and we were together, and it was like no time had passed. And I think my favorite part about filming the pilot, honestly, was any of my free time with Ben. We went to lunch together, we went to dinner together, 